um, that very much links with the way I view astrology, that, that in the universe we have pure potential, pure potentiality in the form of crystalline plasma. And that then steps down to a, to a level of probability determined by your astrological archetypes in your own in your own birth chart and we then as individuals weave that tapestry of our lives our reality around that astrological probability for ourselves it's the modeling clay that's not yet formed so to me it is a map of your individual consciousness and the more we can start to see astrology as potential consciousness moving forwards and a language of love then we we're on a roll to reconnecting with our galactic family as we were in that meditation i kind of uh got transported back to um, when we did our interview with, with Dr. Joe Dispenza, the last thing he told me um, before we started recording, um, when we set our intentions, he said, um, let's open some minds and hearts. Yeah, so yeah. I wanted to just put that in as well. Um, are you ready to open some minds and hearts? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and and uh, the image you had there, Emilio, with the, with the turtles and deep seas, that, that to me instantly made me think of the dwarf planet Sedna. Um, Sedna. Because you may well be aware of Sedna. She has an 11,400-year orbit. So her orbit goes way out to the edge of what's called the Oort cloud. So she's bringing back new galactic information for us. And she's moving closer and closer to the Earth in her orbit. It's, it's a highly elliptical orbit. And for other reasons, she's coming into prominence. And the whole myth around Sedna was, it's a long story, but essentially that she was supposedly rescued by her father from a marriage of betrayal. Um, and they were in a canoe and a storm broke, up, bro uh, broke out. And um, in order to save himself, her father threw Sedna out of the canoe. She tried to climb back in, was hanging on with her fingers, and he chopped her fingers off and she floated down to the deep and became beautiful sea creatures of turtles and whales and dolphins. It was an entire metamorphosis, but it's it's so interesting that not only was that a very obvious betrayal by the patriarchy, you know, your father chopping mm -hmm. the fingers off, his, he doesn't come out so well from that myth, but equally it's an entire release from what we thought were old methods of safety and security that we yes. trusted in the past and just surrendering to the metamorphosis. Mm. And that's in a very strong position to Pluto right now, and that will continue for the next couple of years. Entire death, rebirth, transformation, metamorphosis of, yeah. of humanity. That's what we're moving into. So much is going on right now. And even right before we get into the depths of it, um, I'd love to ask you, first of all, Pam Gregory, welcome on Just Tap In. What are you most excited about right now in your life? Wow. Um, yeah, when I'm getting very excited, I love to go down rabbit holes. So I never have any particular, you know, business plan for 2024. I, I, I just kind of get very interested in things. And because Saturn is in Pisces now, this is very much the blend of, of, of science and spirituality, which is, you know, Joe Dispenza's work as well. I have great admiration for him and I've attended about 14 of his advanced workshops in the past. Mm. Um, but what I'm interested in, and it's so right for this year, is what I want to call the physics of creation. And that sounds incredibly grandiose because I don't have a science background. I'm not a physicist. But we are going to be going in leaps and bounds in our understanding of how the universe is constructed and what that means for us. I mean, a physicist I, I respect greatly is Nassim Harriman, who mm. apparently has now worked out all the calculations for what he calls the physics of, of creation, the physics of how we create our reality. And it's that that interests me a, a great deal of, of how can we better understand how to construct our reality from understanding the science 
Mm. And so that's that's where I am headed. I'm talking later this month to Dr. Jude Curravan, who is an yes. amazingly yes. brilliant cosmologist, to dig into that a little more. And I've already had a pre-chat with her. So it's, I think it, the universe is going to teach us so much, and particularly around April, which is an incredibly powerful month energetically and astrologically, we could be going in some really big jumps in understanding because this year in particular – for various astrological reasons I can talk about if you'd like me to, mm. we are going to be discovering much more about the out there, the further out there. Um, and I can enlarge on that if you if you want me to. Yeah, of course. And, and that has to do a lot with what I've heard you speak upon, the dwarf planets, the Kuiper the Kuiper planets that we are recently discovering and, you know, what what has to do, what, what does that have to do with how it's influencing the collective consciousness of humanity uh, on a deeper level? What have you found in, in your research in that? Yes, I was just having a talk actually with Alan Clay on Monday. Um, I don't even know what day it is today because the weeks <laughs> move so quickly. Um, but he runs the Dwarf Planet University in, in, in New Zealand. And you know, the dwarf planets have been there for many, many thousands of years. These are orbiting bodies that are way beyond the orbit of Pluto. They've been there for thousands of years, as I say, but it's only because we have expanded our consciousness that we are now able to access them and integrate them. And see higher. them. And see them, literally see them. So, yes, of course, the telescopes have, have become um, much stronger. And we're very lucky in having an, ast an astronomer by the name of Mike Brown in America, who luckily is very well versed in mythology. And so he has named them very appropriately, which we discover later, that if you then put them in charts linked to that particular myth, people's charts, you can see how people are actually living them out in a very mm. real way in their in their lives. And so this is very exciting work because they do represent a higher octave of consciousness that is much more expanded and takes us into really living in the collective rather than this way we've lived in the past of what I like to call territorial materialism. You know, this is mine and I've worked hard for it and this is my fence at the edge of my garden and you can't, have, you know, all of that is is collapsing. Being associated by our wealth and our status, the whole lot is going. That's, that's Capricorn and Pluto it's doing a very good job of demolishing that um, as it's moved through since 2008. So we're moving into a much greater sense of egalitarianism, humanitarianism, but also there's so much to say about this because, yes, it's partly the dwarf planets that are expanding our understanding of the universe, but even the fact that, that Pluto is moving into Aquarius. You know, if I look back in in history and look at Pluto has a 248 year orbit, so it has a very long orbit. And if I look back in history, those tended to be paradigm shattering yeah. times. The industrial revolution in the 1500s. Absolutely. Copernicus publishing his heliocentric theory in 1543. I mean, that was absolutely paradigm shattering for the average bloke in the street. Who, who woke up and saw the sun moving around the sky and, and, and all of a sudden it's, he's told that the earth moves around the sun, um, not the other way around. But with each step of this, because Aquarius is ruled by Uranus and Uranus was the sky god in myth. So it's very associated with aviation, but also we get an understanding of the further out there than we have before. The ancient peoples could only see up to Saturn with the naked eye, and that's still true um, for us, and unless we're using a, a telescope, we can only see to, to Saturn. And when Uranus was discovered, this was the first planet beyond the naked eye, as it were. So that took us deeper into space. And particularly this year, not only is, is, is Uranus very strong because it rules Aquarius, but we have a very particular conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus in April, together with the total solar eclipse. It's going to be a heck of a month. Um, and whenever we've had that, there has been another step in understanding the cosmos, the galaxy, but also a big step in 
in aviation, for instance, the, the first hot air balloon ride, the White Brothers crossing the Atlantic for the first time. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Also, if you look at people who are very technologically able, like Steve Jobs, he has a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. Tim Berners-Lee set up the World Wide Web. He has a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. So this is mm. going to give us a leap in technology, a leap in cosmic understanding, uh, a, a big jump, I think, in space exploration, a big leap in understanding that we are going to be reunited to our galactic family, that we truly understand we are galactic beings. You know, the, the calcium in our bones comes from the galaxy. The iron in our blood comes from the galaxy. Mm -hmm. We are galactic beings. We've just had this ridiculous idea of separation but we are going to reconnect, and that's going to start as early as April. We're going to get a stronger and stronger sense. So all this crazy thing about you know little green men being scary things. I mean, you know, this is our family. We're going to reconnect with. And now let's let's really blow people's minds right now with the galactic origin because in December I recently had the opportunity to travel to Egypt uh, with a group of forty people with Robert Edward Grant and. It was one of the most impactful weeks of my life, and I discovered how how deep astrology really goes in our in our ancient history. So, just to tell you this story, we we got to spend a night inside the Great Pyramid um, and visit the King's Chamber. And along the week, uh, you know, a few days leading up to that, I had a couple conversations with Robert about this, and he's going to come back on the show to really go deep into it, but. Um, he started telling me that he would spend nights in the king's chamber by himself. And as he started opening his third eye, he started seeing around the walls of the king's chamber these figures. And then he started putting that together and they became astrological constellations around the walls of the king's chamber. And when I asked him, but like, did the Egyptians put that up there? He's like, He's like, no, the Egyptian government has actually tried to wash those off because it goes against the narrative that these these um, Egyptians built the pyramids. And I asked him then, who was it? And he said one word. He literally said Arcturian. And I was like, OK, um, so let's let's really dive deep into that around the galactic origins, because if they had knowledge of astrology way before ancient Egypt, way before that, and if it was really these uh, galactic beings who helped build the pyramids, then how did they have so much knowledge of astrology at that time? Yeah, well, that's a Google God question, I think, rather than that. <laughs> and I'll ask a question, to be honest, because, I mean, this is into quite big stuff. But Robert, whose work I follow and I think is quite brilliant, has just put out another podcast in the last few hours talking mm -hmm. about that trip and what yeah. happened and how he is now translating the language inside the pyramids as Arcturian language. But you were there on that trip. And yes, he, he had an astronomer, astrologer with him, and they perceived that the, the zodiac signs were, were all you know, inscribed all around the, um, the walls of the, the pyramid, and they moved in a kind of linear time direction, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, etc. So that was going forwards in time, but then he perceived another layer above that, which is the processional cycle, when the ages move backwards. We know we're moving out of the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. So that goes backwards. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know in the spiritual realm, time does not exist in a linear fashion. And, and Saturn in Pisces is actually dissolving our sense of linear time anyway. But time is way more complex than we think. It moves forwards. It moves backwards. It's, it's in a vortex. It's cyclical. So that is absolutely astonishing. And the thing about the Arcturians, I mean, for sure, whoever built the pyramids came from out there because it was only through, I think, the brilliant work of Robert Bouval, I think, was the first person to discover that. It was only when he was flying above the pyramids that he could see the pattern of the pyramids, you know, two large ones and the smaller one offset that was a perfect mirror of the belt of Orion. 
Orion, yeah. That was a belt of, you know, mirror reflection of the belt of Orion. So they must have come from out there in order to get that pattern on Earth. So why did they build them using the language of astrology? And the reason I think they did was because that's a universal language. Not so, It's not only a galactic language, and by the way, I think astrology is going to go through huge leaps and bounds in the coming years to reconnect to our galactic families, but it was it was a language of universality. You know, it wasn't French, Spanish, Chinese. It was astrological and astronomical. And this is really the age that we're moving into right now. Huh. And what do you think that humanity must understand first about astrology in order for us to evolve our perception of it and then start connecting with the the universal language, the universal beings that are out there as well, um, waiting to connect with us when we move up to the higher octave of consciousness. Yeah, yeah great question, because traditionally, as you probably know, Emilio, astrology has been quite fated. What are the planets doing to me? It's been quite fated and predestined. And The and horoscopes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> God, I've never in my entire career ever talked about sun signs. You know, smack me if I do. But you know, I'm really trying to enable people to see it as this is, this is our unique sheet of music. This is our modeling clay. And it's pure potentiality. And you know, if you look at the work of the theoretical physicist um, David Bohm, um, that very much links with the way I view astrology, that, that in the universe we have pure potential, pure potentiality in the form of crystalline plasma. And that then steps down to a, to a level of probability determined by your astrological archetypes in your own in your own birth chart and we then as individuals weave that tapestry of our lives our reality around that astrological probability for ourselves mm -hmm. and so really astrology your birth chart is a flat you know as a flat piece of paper a four piece of paper is actually pure potential for you to live. It's the it's the music that's not yet played. It's the modeling clay that's not yet formed. So to me, it is a map of your individual consciousness. And the more we can start to see astrology as potential consciousness moving forwards and a language of love, then we, we're on a roll to reconnecting with our galactic family. Because we know, kind of <laughs> blowing circuits a little. Bit. <laughs> we know that the universe is is full of water vapor. Actually, I mean, stars are just exploding into water all the time, which comes to Earth. Some of the water on Earth is four point five billion years old, and that water from very far galaxies is coming in as rain. Uh, we drink it, we ingest it, it becomes us. We you know, we pass it out and it moves on and you know, through many human beings and then back to the galaxy. So we are in a constant flow of what Vader Austin is now referring to, and I'm really with her on this, as God consciousness. Yes. And it is the water that is also affecting and evolving our DNA. The information from the water is helping to evolve our DNA and and remember, reenact, re revigorate those strands that have been dormant for so long to raise our consciousness, to reconnect us to, to our galactic families. So all of this, it's all of a piece because, of course, we are living just in one consciousness. The whole thing is one consciousness. Everything is connected. So in understanding astrology as the potentiality, the pure potentiality of consciousness, and a language of love, and the more we can imprint water with love, we are not only upgrading our own physical vessel, we are broadcasting that out to the world and to the entire galaxy. Mm. It, it, we infect everybody and everything and the crystalline plasma all around us with high-frequency love. And what is astrology saying about how our physicality, our physical bodies are shifting? Um, you know, another friend, uh, Richard Rudd, he talks about 
the DNA. Um, we are unlocking more potentiality within our DNA as well. I heard you also had a dream once that you were in a light body. Maybe it was a premonitious sort of dream in a future lifetime or, or an, a parallel reality. But what is astrology saying about how our bodies are transforming as well with all the currents of energy, the solar flares going into the planet right now? Um, what's changing in our body? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge questions. Well, firstly, I'd, I'd take Saturn in Pisces because Saturn is our, our bone structure, if you like, our density. It's linked to lead, the metal lead, gravity, weightiness. In Pisces, it's being dissolved. So that's yeah. a very clear astrological signature that our density is dissolving. Um, other aspects um, of, of going almost beyond astrology is you're probably well aware that because we are moving through a particular area of space called the galactic current sheet and through the photon belt with this very high frequency light coming in, um, that is upgrading um, every cell in our body as well. And it comes down to what's our level of consciousness in terms of how much of that light we can embody. We are literally becoming more light beings as we move forward. And that's happening pretty rapidly as well. And yes, the other thing that's very much affecting our physiology, literally every cell in our body, is the huge increase in solar flares because we're peaking in solar cycle 25 early, as I'm sure you know. Um, I think just a few days ago, uh, we had something like 23 M-class flares in about 36 oh, wow. hours. In what? 2018, we didn't have a yeah. single M-class flare, not, not one. So that gives you the scale of difference. Now, on the one hand, the solar flares are also creating great turbulence in the energetic field. You know, it it's upgrading Gaia, but that's happening so rapidly that, the, as I understand it, the, the iron and nickel core of the Earth is expanding and causing more, more seismic activity. The ionosphere around our Earth is also much more unstable than it's been, partly because of the solar flares, partly because of Gaia's own upgrade. Um, and that unstable ionosphere has been caused by natural things like moving through the photon belt, but also unnatural EMFs, satellites, that kind of thing. Nevertheless, all of that, all of those things are ingredients for our, for our evolution because we as humanity are having to travel really fast with no dress rehearsal on we are going to have to upgrade our frequency really rapidly in order to assimilate these high frequencies and go beyond them to thrive and go beyond them to thrive. So the more we can, you know, if a medieval person turned up now, they would be polaxed by the EMFs and the, the frequency we have on Earth, right? They would just fall over. But we as humanity have been able to upgrade so in our physicality so rapidly, we're able to go beyond anything which may be harmful, I truly believe this, and thrive. So the more we can get to the light body through staying in love, Staying in peace, doing our meditative work, staying in stillness, not going <gasps> interfere with big scary things, the more we will just ride these waves towards the light body. And that very clear dream I had that I will never forget, it was so crystal clear and pin sharp. And for those who didn't hear it, it was literally, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds long at the end of the night. And, and I walked into a room that was empty, apart from being filled with kind of sparkly pink and peach light. And the only thing in the room was a mirror. And I walked up to the mirror and looked in the mirror and I was just pure light. I was just light body and my eyes were just extraordinary. And then I started to just levitate, just lift off, at which point the alarm went off, which was really annoying. But that wasn't just a promise for me. That was a promise for all of us mm -hmm. going forwards. And many people are starting to talk about this, experience this in, them, in their meditations, because this is happening quickly. We are shedding density really quickly. Yeah, we're moving into a new density, the fourth density or the fifth. Um, since you were around seven absolutely I and know it's that... all happening yeah it's all happening the you know the the reconnections on the dna the reconnection to the galactic family the rising frequency it it's all of a piece it's all of a piece because we're one consciousness hmm. 
And since you were around seven, you've had an obsession with time and even picked out a book that was called Time, I believe. And we mentioned briefly uh, a moment ago about how what Robert is finding in these pyramids is that essentially the clock is going backwards. Um, I was wondering if we could dive into uh, that topic a little bit deeper um, in terms of what does that actually mean on an astrological perspective that time is moving backwards. You know, I, I just remember being in the king's chamber and then Matthias uh, De Stefano, he was channeling and he was just going tick tock, tick talk the whole time and i asked him he's like he's like time is changing um so i was wondering if you had any any insights or perspectives on that yeah it's an interesting question i remember many years ago as a student um with a brilliant astrological tutor and of course we were so used to looking forwards with the transits and progressions and solar arcs etc and he did a whole workshop on okay let's take your your birth chart and let's work time backwards now. And we were blown away that all of the same experiences worked equally well if we took time backwards as opposed to forwards. And it was kind of, you know, how do we get our heads around that? You know, because we're so programmed into clock time. Um, yes, certainly the shifts of the ages, as I say, go backwards. You know, we're moving from um, from Pisces into Aquarius for another 2,000 or so years, and then we'll move back into Capricorn. So that time goes backwards. But I think what it's also saying is we are remembering civilizations from the past, and I'm thinking here of Atlantis and also Lemuria in particular, that were beautiful civilizations, exquisite, where they, they lived in this sense of Lemuria in particular, they lived as light bodies. They were connected by a silver cord to the earth, but they spent a lot of time in their light body. And they were completely immersed in the sense of oneness with the universe, with every other living thing. So they had incredible telepathy, te telepathic ability, incredible healing ability. And that knowledge has never been lost. That knowledge is in the field. And so in going backwards in time, in one way, we are picking up, we are remembering some of those incredible abilities in ancient times like Lemuria and bringing them back into our current time and our future going mm -hmm. forward. So there's this, this cyclical remembrance. And if you look at the archetypes for the dwarf planets, many of them have this it's very Lemurian, you know, have this ancient shamanic connection to the earth, this instinctive connection to nature, um, you know, take a planet, a dwarf planet like Homer, who could summon wild food from the land, even if the land had been laid waste with her magic stick, the Makalai and her shamanic abilities. But they also have a kind of leading edge understanding of how we manifest, how we create our reality with, with kind of quantum mechanics. And so they they remind us of the ancient that was so beautiful and that knowledge and those skills have never been lost and they're coming back into our remembrance. But we are also moving forwards into the next cycle of evolution of through the expansion of our consciousness, even beyond those times. OK, let's take this forward another giant step because we're going to be living in this this revolution of love, this physics of love going forwards. So, so I don't know if that fully answers your question, Emilio, but that's kind of how I s see where we're going. Beautiful. And just to give people the context as well, and also for my own understanding, why have we uh, stated that time or the clock essentially is going backwards? Does that have any astrological connotations to it? I think just the processional cycle that we always move backwards with the ages. We, we move forwards with the zodiac signs and with our clocks and our birthdays, etc. But these ages around about 2,150, 2,160 years always move in reverse order. And that's why I think, you know, there's a sense of nothing is ever lost. Nothing is ever lost. All of knowledge is captured within the cosmos and we can weave our future, weave our future reality by revisiting that in a much more conscious way going forwards. 
you mentioned uh, again the dwarf planets and how they've been linked so much to the mythologies and um, even the people that are discovering them like Mike Brown are naming them after mythological um, figures and then it actually lines up so um, I'd love to go through some of those new ones, um, the new planetary archetypes that are coming up. One that I wrote down that really stood out to me was Vada, um, yeah. the Star Lady. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you'd like to go down your your favorite ones or the ones that maybe are the most important right now to know about um, for people because we're just beginning to discover them as well. Yeah, Vada is really strong at the moment, particularly actually at this new moon, which is coming up on Friday, on the on the on the ninth of February, because she is exactly um, opposed to Mercury. She's at seven of Leo, Mercury's at seven of Aquarius, and Vada in myth, Tolkien even writes about her in his book Cimmerillion, because she's part of the creation myth, and she, with her husband Manwe, was said to create the universe, the cosmos. And Manwe was was the highest archangel, closest to the mind of God. Varda was the one who um, who created the um, the heavens, the stars, the moon, um, the sun, and and sent them on their course. So they were part of the original creation. So they're immensely powerful. And Alan Clay, in his new book, um, New Stars for a New Era, that's just come out, he is describing Varda as mastery consciousness mastery mm. consciousness, uh, becoming masters of our, our thinking. And really, that's one of the key themes for Pluto in Aquarius, becoming masters of our thinking. The shadow side of that is having our thoughts completely controlled by technology. So, you know, um, head, heads up for that. But if we can become masters of our thoughts, then we master our reality completely. So it's mastery consciousness going forwards, being aware that every thought, every feeling becomes the frequency that we emanate and that creates our daily reality. I mean, this is very much the work of Joe Dispenza as well, but we are helping to um, infect the collective with a higher frequency too. So Vada is beautiful and all of the dwarf planets have a very strong moral compass but they abide by natural law, by divine law, never man-made law. And so Vada's role, along with many of the other dwarf planets, was to punish those who strayed from integrity, who strayed from truth, and make them see the error of their ways, make them see the lies, and shift them back into the light. And you can see clear as day, you know, that's playing out right now. And and not to have people maybe go go into that that lens of fear when you say punish, when we're looking at it in our perspective, um, how do we see that when we're out of integrity? How does the universe self correct in its divine law so that we start acting more in in integrity and and have that morality um, going forward? Yeah, really nice question, Amelia. Because I think in you know in three D our three D land, there's always a sense of we were right and you were wrong. There's a sense of uh, polarity that comes in there. We're going to move way beyond that. So that for any individuals concerned who uh, recognize that they have stepped out of integrity, they are going to move through that process themselves without a, any external forces coming into play mm -hmm. to correct that. If I'm if I'm making myself clear, they will self-correct yeah. their own karma. And I think that's very much the message of Vada. You self-correct your own uh, own karma by seeing the error of your ways and moving forwards into the light and surrendering mm. um, what may have what may not have served you well. Because mm. we're moving into a time where it's much more about service to others than service to self. Mm. And from your... That's also um, in the law of one. Um, if you read that material, the raw contact. Yep, long time ago. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we just had uh, Aaron Apke on the show. He's a like a modern teacher of of the law of one, um, and we got into that path of service or path to self, and it's the same. It's the positive polarity and then the negative polarity. Um, you mentioned the term divine law. I would love to get into, from your understanding, what are the main laws that this universe abides by? 
I think it is very much um, being in harmony with everything in the galaxy, being in right relationship, causing no harm, causing no loss, causing no crime, but being in constant harmony and balance. And again, the Lemurians excelled at this, that you know that you would never hurt another sentient being because that would be hurting yourself ultimately because everything is connected and doing everything for the benefit of nature the benefit of the earth the benefit of the animals the trees the plants the snails the slugs you know everything and respecting and loving every piece of sentient life and this is almost kind of pantheism that divine spirit is with every you know rocks crystals that divine spirit is in everything and that to me is divine law that's how divine law thrives in in the world and again we are going back to that which is beautiful so there's no need for laws that are written out and courts of justice and all these great <laughs> legal terms the commandments yeah yeah i mean that's all you know really old old stuff we are gonna we are gonna self-correct we are gonna self-govern through our own mm. healing of anything which hurts another living being will, will hurt us. Yeah. And and in simplified terms, that really is just the law of one. We are all one. Yeah. And in in the raw contact, uh, the second most important universal law is that of free will. So when we're speaking it from astrological terms, a lot of people might say like, oh, like this is my chart, so my life is gonna turn out this way. You've mentioned the term of of pure potentiality. Um, where does free will really come in when you're studying someone's uh, birth chart and and looking at it from their also sole purpose, where they're headed as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. Really good because again, as I said, the old astrology was very fated. You know, this will happen to you. You must not get on that plane. Otherwise, you know, it's a very accident-prone time, which is which is terrible, really, because you're limiting that person's life by your own judgments and your own consciousness. But it's, it's way beyond that because, as I say, if we view each chart, and each chart is unique, it will never be lived in history again, which says we're all special. I mean, isn't that, isn't that an amazing thought? Every chart is completely unique. But if we take it that that is your, your unique sheet of music, which I think is quite a helpful analogy, you have complete free will, I, I deeply believe, in how you play that. You can butcher it on a tin box with a spoon, mm. or you can make it absolutely magnificent, you know, the London Philharmonic, whatever, um, because if, through my time of studying many thousands of charts, I very often in doing that, seeing two people who actually have a chart that's quite close to each other in time and geography, and one might have pulled back a little and had a smaller life, and 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 this is not my judgment, that's their judgment. I remember a particular couple of people that came to see me quite close in time as well, and they'd had parallel lives in many ways. They had great gifts with music. They got married at the same time. They had children at the same time. But one had worked at a local comprehensive school teaching music, and the other was actually doing brilliantly in an international um, philharmonic orchestra. And so it's not my judgment that that was a small life and a big life. It's mm -hmm. down to that own person's judgment of... Um, how, how fully have I lived my life? How fully have I blossomed into my dharma, that which I was meant to become? Because in each chart, there will be the potential to be a sunflower, a rose, a chrysanthemum. You know, it's like the, if you think of an oak tree, all of that information is held in the acorn. Everything is held in the acorn. It doesn't need, it needs light and it needs water, but it doesn't need additional information because it's all, encapsulate you know it's a time capsule almost in that in that acorn and that's what the birth chart is like but mm. it, it it gives you the potential of your gifts that you are going to be more athletic or more mathematical uh or more artistic or whatever you know rose a chrysanthemum whatever and it's very helpful to know that from a young age because then the parent can actually nurture their children in different ways because they all have you know, different potentialities and then you it's up to you to live it absolutely as fully as as you can 
Mm -hmm. to really step into that dharma, that which you are meant to become. Yeah. And after more than 45 years of studying astrology, what would you say that you found through studying this practice or this ancient language that are your gifts in this lifetime? Oh, wow. I mean, I could I could talk for a long, long time about that. Yeah. <laughs> because for me, I don't know what my life would have been without astrology, actually, Emilio. I don't know what my mm. life would have been. It would have been, I think, much smaller, to be honest. Mm. It's really helped me to step into my dharma. And, you know, I think I've still got a long way to go. Um, yes. So it, it, it operates on many levels because on one level, it's, it's a very practical framework for life. If you're having Jupiter transits, you can um, play your luck a little more. You can explore. If you're having Uranus transits, you can, you're encouraged to be the maverick, the one who breaks the rules, the one who um, goes beyond the boundaries. Um, if you're having Saturn transit, it has a very different purpose and meaning that you have to keep your head down, you have to work very hard, you have to be very diligent, uh, can't bunk off work early, and then you get your reward at the end. So each planetary transit has a very different meaning, purpose, and archetype. And it's almost like just watching a weather forecast. You know, if you know there's a huge rainstorm coming, that's really helpful information because you don't go out without your umbrella and your raincoat, it's helpful information. It doesn't rule your life, but it's really helpful to know. So at a very practical level, astrology helps us in a day-to-day -day sense. At another level, it absolutely helps us to um, understand our soul's purpose in this lifetime. What you know, And this is really linked to the nodal axis. And my, my last book was about the nodal axis because in this is much bigger in Vedic astrology. It dominates mm -hmm. the whole birth chart, much less so in Western astrology. But essentially, this is linked to the orbit of the moon, but the north node in your birth chart shows you your compass needle, where you are meant to be headed in terms of developing gifts and skills in this particular lifetime as defined by the sign and the house area. You know, for me, mine is in Aquarius, astrology, doing something weird in the third house of communication. So I write and speak and, you know, weird stuff. Um, so it gives great clarity because when I saw that, the chart all of a sudden was no longer circular. It became like a teardrop shape almost, that the, the north node was your compass needle and everything else in the birth chart was the cavalry was the cavalry mm. to back up your soul's path of growth in this lifetime. And the south node is where we have already developed our gifts and we can easily fall back because they're familiar and safe and known. But if we do that, we'll never crack virgin territory. The purpose is to move forwards into things which may not feel comfortable, where you've got to be a bit of a pioneer in something new, but that's where your soul will grow. So for me, I mean, you know, I, I, I've got a long way to go with this. I've got lifetimes to go with this in terms of stretching my consciousness to a different point. So as I say, where I'm now headed is really trying to understand this consciousness um, revolution, this revolution of love, this revolution of understanding the physics of creation to start doing some kind of um, deep space astrology, galactic astrology. Mm. And I'm just, I've got L plates on with that. We are just at the beginnings of that, of what is our, our galactic family? Is it Palladian? Is it Arcturian? Is it Andromedan? And how does that work in terms of our dharma and our soul's purpose this time around? Mm. You know, we're stepping way beyond the earth right now. And I know there was a clairvoyant who emailed you or wrote to you saying that she started seeing a lot of blue light around your field um, and how these blue beings that can also even be seen in Joe Dispenza workshops, yeah. uh, working on people. Have you had any direct experience with your galactic family in this life? I get it. I get it in my dreams and in my writing and the Arcturians for sure. I think are are very close. I I actually feel that I have a particularly what's called a healing pod in this this room here, and uh, sensitive people who step in say, 
this is Arcturian energy. And I think the way I operate is quite Arcturian. It, it, you know, it's got to have a sort of science aspect to it, but also the spiritual aspect. And more and more in my dreams, I'm seeing these these very tall beings, these these blue beings, who I think are also linked to Sirius as well, which are spiritual sun. But they are coming forth with with clearer messages of where I where I've got to head to. And so many people have talked about these blue orbs around me in my videos. And you know, I'm not aware of them in my videos. I just gotta stay on track with the dates, the degrees and the minutes. But, you know, so but I'm obviously in the zone because you know I always say before every video, come on down guys and let's They're feeding it. you the information too. Yeah, yeah. Because it's that <laughs> bit at the end where I kind of go off piece from the data. And that often, mm. particularly if people aren't familiar with astrology, that's the most useful bit because I'm talking more generally about consciousness or, or whatever. And I think that's where the blue beings and the Arcturians in particular are coming in. And that's a, a stronger and stronger feeling for me as I move forward. Mm. They've got a lot to teach me. I'm just at the very first steps of that. Yeah, because you've even sprinkled a lot of information in this podcast about uh, Lemurians, um, that civilization. I'm really curious from where is that knowledge about those ancient civilizations coming through for you? Are they direct uh, insights, downloads that are coming through? Have you uh, studied um, ancient civilizations? Where, where does that knowledge uh, come in for you? I think for me it comes through nature. And Lemurians were very connected to the light. They were very connected to mountaintops because they used to build, you may know, Emilio, they used to build their healing temples out of crystals, always on the top of mountains because that's where the energy vortex was, and they knew that. And these healing temples were literally just crystals with you know, bits of sort of wooden struts and canvas over them, but the healing power was drawn from the mountain, a little bit like the pyramids, you know, being an energy mm. source as, as well, in the you know, same shape as it were, the top of the mountain. And so when I'm in nature and I can see this different quality of light emerging, this very fine, sparkly diamond photonic light, and I see the blend of everything, how as I'm walking through the wood and with the wild ponies and donkeys and, and the dragonflies, I feel that everything is morphing. Everything is morphing into that crystalline light. Everything is morphing into one. And everything is pulsating love. That's how I feel it, just pure pulsating love. So I think for sure I have some connection back to Lemuria because that's kind of one of my go-to places in terms of a spiritual connection. And day by day, even if it's absolutely chucking it down in England, which it so often is, I can still connect to that kind of finesse of, of, of bright white sparkly light and mm. and it brings in a feeling of love and just everything everything having a life force as i walk through the wood everything vibrant life force humming electric just full of being that is constantly wanting to evolve to a higher state of being mm. you mentioned the pyramids do you believe they were also uh, healing temples? 100%. 100%. I haven't been myself. My good friend Heather Ensworth, I think, would love to love, love to take me there. But um, yes, absolutely. Because as I understand it, in the main pyramids, they didn't ever find a body. Those are in different pyramids. So what was the purpose of, of these? And I know certainly toning, I was listening to a video just yesterday by John Stuart Reed, who was allowed to go into, I think, the, the king's chamber. And um, he put some sand on the uh, sarcophagus and toned. And he had someone with him who was very powerful at toning. And not only was he seeing patterns, as you'd normally get with cymatics in sand, he was seeing patterns of hieroglyphics. Mm. which is just mm -hmm. astounding, isn't it? So mm -hmm. for sure, I think they were used for healing, using toning, using sound. And you may know also there's a, uh, there's a very good TED talk, quite an old TED talk now with a professor from a London music school called Anthony Holland. And he discovered that the 11th harmonic shatters cancer cells, shatters cancer wow. cells. So, you know, think how much money that would save <laughs> <in> medical services. 
I think there would be no industry, <laughs> no, no drugs, no industry. So we we are on the brink because if you think of the glyph of Aquarius, it's two jaggedy lines of energy and frequency. We are going to learn so much about the healing power of light and sound as we move forward. And for sure, I believe that they were used as healing chambers. Yeah, I have absolutely mm -hmm. no doubt about that. And I think Robert believes that too, from what I understand from his um, podcast. Yeah. And we are entering, um, we're just about a month in 2024, what you've been calling a historic year, revolutionary year, a pivot point, um, leaps of consciousness, giving an overview. Um, of course, you know, Pluto entering Aquari Aquarius, which you've briefly mentioned. Um, these are around, you know, 200 plus year uh, cycles. What are we seeing now going forward? You mentioned there's some huge changes coming um, in the next about two or three years. Yeah, so so much here. Um, well, firstly, I, I just did a video a, a week or so ago that kind of went crazy called Revolution 2.0 .2 because mm -hmm. I was expecting as Pluto entered Aquarius, we would um, be in an energy that was much more revolutionary. Um, because Capricorn has been very much a vertical structure of top-down control. And historically, whether that was the church or autocratic monarchy or whatever, in our times we might say that was in governments or corporations or institutions that have very much been elitist and held power over us. So that is kind of crumbling. Those old structures are crumbling. So I knew that Pluto moving into Aquarius would be a big deal in a revolutionary sense because that starts to shift the power back to the grassroots, to the people. Um, and, and very often to younger people, actually. Aquarius is very linked to younger people in particular. And so what you're seeing in Europe right now, and you are in Europe, Emilio, so you know you know better <laughs> than I do what is happening with the farmers in Feeling Europe. all of it. <laughs> you know, the farmers in Europe, this is like an exact replay of 1789. When the peasants stormed the Bastille, took down the monarchy, monarch was executed, France became a republic. And um, they are not going to give in because they've reached a pivot point of there is too much inequality. The power has to shift back. And if we look at 1789 and what happened in France, um, that was the beginning. It, was, it took some years, but that was the beginning of the formation of the first middle class ever. I think um, small enterprises started to begin, small businesses, small farms. Um, the tax rules changed to take away benefits from the aristocracy and benefit the ordinary people. And within a month of that storming of the Bastille in August 1789, the Assemblée Nationale published something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Only men at that point, not women, never mind. Um, and that became the foundational document for democracy across Europe. So this was a massive socio-economic and political shift, which began in 1789. So I knew something big was going to happen. So not only that revolution in Europe, but if we look at what's happening to America right now, the charts that I believe most astrologers use is the 4th of July, 1776, the Declaration of Independence. And that, of course, came from um, the, the wonderful beings leaving the onerous taxation and control of King George in England and saying, no, we're going to create a land of liberty, freedom, equality, and off we went to the new land. And there were 13 British colonies originally that became divorced from the old, you know, old England and set up this this new world. So this is now, a, and if you look at what's happening in America, and yes, there are many layers and smoke and mirrors to this, of course they are, because revolution is never tidy. But nevertheless, it is people standing up and saying, no, we are going to take the power back, because it's a time of great sovereignty. Remembering our sovereignty, remember that we have to live from the inside out, not the outside in. Remember that we are powerful, co-creating beings. And this is the urge. This is the urge that's happening. Now, that's going to be super strong all this year. And, and so, you know, Pluto is going to be in Aquarius till 2044. But it's always particularly when it enters a sign, we feel this shift in energy that becomes very strong. Now, that's going to be heightened in April. 
because Jupiter conjuncts Uranus, which is the ruler of Aquarius. Jupiter always expands that energy. So we're going to see even more revolutionary energy around this time. It's not going to go away and it is going to accelerate the collapse of the old order. A lot of truth, a lot of revelation, a lot of shock, a lot of surprise, a lot of awakening. It's all going to feed into, okay, how do we birth a much more loving, joyful, abundant, and compassionate world than we currently have. How do we do that? And we've been living um, in that energy of Capricorn, which is very much the top-down structure, hierarchical approach. And you're saying that Aquarius energy is much more decentralized. 100%. What does that look like? Dis ab absolutely. Well, it's going to be grassroots up, communities, collaborations, people coming together. Many groups are starting up all over the world and have been over the last uh, couple of years because COVID really had a boomerang effect that could be because we were shut down, locked down our homes in various places. There's a boomerang effect that we want to connect to other human beings, different ages, different backgrounds, different work, different every, it doesn't matter. We just want to connect with other human beings to hug, to laugh and to say, boy, we're not going to do that again. You know, how do we create a better world? So there was one chap in Australia who set up the stand in the park idea. I don't know if you've heard about these, and these happen are happening all over the world, that you, you gather for free on a Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, people come together, and they say, okay, what do we do? So I'm in a big group of well over 100 people. You know, we've got a carpenter, we've got a builder, we've got an astrologer, we've got many healers, therapists. We are all doing something positive to start to create a new world. Many groups are buying land, they're growing food, they're using new healing technologies, so you don't even have to go and see your regular doctor. There are ways by using um, you know, there are all kinds of new devices that we're using, but also going back to homeopathy, plant medicine, all that kind of thing, because you know we are saying nature has everything that we need to heal ourselves. And so we are taking the power back in that way out of the system that we have lived in. And that is happening all over the world at speed. These groups are really accelerating in velocity and momentum. And that's going to happen a lot more this year. And so mm -hmm. that's how the new earth is going to be born. And it's happening right now. I'm in it. You know, I'm in a group that's doing that. Yeah. And maybe a lot of people tuning into this conversation might consider themselves um maybe outsiders if they're getting into these esoteric topics and then they're around in their communities and you know uh, struggling to find who to talk to this about um but you've said that this is a moment where the outsiders become the leaders yeah i love that what does that mean yeah i love that because it's people who would never want to be a leader would never want to be a leader because they don't want to be the kind of old style top-down leader, I am telling you what to do. I'm giving you rules and regulations. You know, again, we're all done with that. So this is people, I would say, absolutely, Robert Edward Grant is one of those. You know, people who are visionaries, who are I ideas, people who are progressives. Uh, I think Nassim Harriman is another one of those who, you know, is, is shattering paradigms um, with his view of physics. Um, so people who would never, ever say, I'm a leader in this new world, but they are, because what they do is attract people around them who say, I love your work. I love what you're doing. I love your vision. For, and, and they are all very heart-centered people. They're heart-centered people who themselves, perhaps, I mean, I know Nassim Harriman, he, he, he never went to school. He left school very early because he was severely d dyslexic. He didn't fit in. Yeah. And nature was his teacher. With all of his physics, nature was his teacher. So these are people who may have felt on the periphery. They didn't fit mm. in. They didn't work with the system. I mean, as an astrologer, you know, I have been severely ridiculed over the years. But, but actually, I don't care because this is my mission. This is my dharma. So it's people who have not operated within mainstream society who are going to attract people, magnetize people around them to start to create something very different. And again, it's heart-centered and it's birthed from love. Hmm. And looking ahead uh, to April, um, you mentioned it briefly, there's going to be a total solar eclipse, um, giving people a context of what, why, why is that solar eclipse going to give us 
a new beginning, as you've mentioned? Well, in a way, every total solar eclipse is a new beginning because it's like a super big new moon. So it's in that sense. So if it falls on something very specific in your your chart, you can have a sense of jumping forwards in your in your uh, soul's path of growth. Uh, you know, if it falls on your sun or your midheaven, you suddenly get an opportunity uh, in your in your work, perhaps, or somebody promotes your work, or a project opens up. There's there's a wild card aspect to it. There's a jumping forwards aspect. So it's like a big new beginning for. for for many, many people. But it's going to be particularly strong in the US because the eclipse path falls across the US. The previous, um, we had August 2017, total solar eclipse fell northwest to southeast across America. Or, um, October 14th last year, total solar eclipse fell northwest to southeast. This one coming up on the 8th of April is falling northeast to southwest. So the crossing point is Texas. So I knew that something was going to happen in Texas. But this is within the context of the US of its total Pluto return. Transiting Pluto in the heavens and its orbit coming back for the very first time since the US was born in 1776. Mm -hmm. So you put those two things together and you think, wow, this is going to be a very big time of rebirth for the US, who and what is the US. And that may involve certainly a change in political structure, economic structure, but I think it could even involve a change in geography. Who and what makes up the, the US going forwards? Some states uh -huh. may break away. So it's going to be very big uh -huh. in that way. And whatever happens in the US, obviously economically, will ripple across the rest of the world, but also politically. Whatever truth comes to light will ripple across the rest yeah. of the world. So this is going to be huge. And because it's also conjunct Chiron, this is going to be a big healing in victim consciousness. So many of us have been encouraged to live in victim consciousness. And, and Chiron in Aries, it's wounded in the I amness, if you like. People who have natally Chiron Aries, they have a sense in the early years of do I even have a right to exist? They're wounded in the I amness. But the purpose mm. of it is to step into leadership and sovereignty with that. So that total solar eclipse being super tightly conjunct Chiron, I think is going to be a big part of the awakening to heal an awful lot of the victim consciousness of, hey, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. I am, mm. I am a sovereign, powerful co-creator and i'm going to step into that energy right now and that's going to be a whole energy shift at that time yeah and that's backed I'm, up by the jupiter um uranus conjunction as well following a couple of weeks later i'm fascinated by your brain right now because i can only imagine i mean you've said before that astrology um when it comes to predictions it's always symbolical um not absolute or um I forget the word you use, yeah. but it's symbolical. And I can only imagine the level of neural connections that have to go into your brain when you're reading. And, and this is 45 years of experience of learning the energies, learning the, you know, the, the sim symbologies, the myths of each planet, each zodiac. Um, so I'm just fascinated with your brain. I just wanted to, <laughs> to mention that. <laughs> That's very generous of you, Emilio. It's very generous. You know, there's a lot going on here. I, I, I feel often quite buzzed up when I'm mm. when I'm doing my videos or I'm writing, I feel quite jazzed up, but I think that's energy, you know, I can't take credit for it. I think it's coming through me rather than from me. That yeah. um, you know, people say I'm channeling, I don't know if I'm channeling, but but certainly information is coming in at speed at many levels. Yes. Um, that's my, my feeling. Yeah. And as an astrologist, you're always looking out to foresee any any events that happen. Has there been an event in, you know, the last couple of years where you've said, I had no idea this was coming? No, not. I never know the event. I never know the actual execution and the specifics. But what, what all astrologers can see is the energy. Uh, in in any chart, they can see the area of life. If it's an individual chart, is it going to be career, health, you know, money, whatever? But also the timing. And so, with that very big Saturn Pluto conjunction, in oh, it was on the twelfth of January, twenty twenty. I just kept seeing jackboots on the tarmac. 
contraction, control. Because if you go back historically, if you looked at when that was last in Capricorn, I think the last time was uh, 1517, 1518, um, there's a theme of the abuse of power, the abuse of top-down power. So I knew there was going to be some major, major event of contraction and control, but I didn't know how it was mm. going to play out. But it's interesting, we're moving out of all of that contraction now into expansion and expansion of consciousness. And the other, you know, you were asking about these big shifts going forwards, there's so many indications of new beginning. There's Pluto moving into Aquarius, but also over the next three years, the outer traditional planets, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, as well as Pluto, are all changing signs. They're moving from water and earth, heavy and slow, into air and fire. You and that's rare, right? That, that doesn't happen. Rare. You've got to go back about 300 years to when that happened before, but that doesn't even include the dwarf planets because many of the dwarf planets are shifting sign as well now that we know wow. that we didn't know 300 years ago. So if you add into the in the dwarf planets, which are shifting sign, like Sedna right now, I mean, end of Taurus into Gemini, it's, I, you know, I, I can't go back fast. And I, I, I don't know if there'll ever be a time which is such a major shift. And it's the end of the processional cycle from end of Pisces moving into Aquarius. So you've mm. got so many at every level, you've got so many endings, beginnings, endings, beginnings. You know, there's no way we're going back to the old. I mean, there's absolutely no way. There's so much energy and life force to propel us forwards. And that's going to accelerate this year. Hmm. It's not going to be dull. It's going to be a mess at the 3D level because we're smashing out the old kitchen cupboards to make space for the new. 3D level, rubble, dust, builder's yard, a mess. Higher level, exhilarating, expansive, yeah. loving, can't ride it fast enough. And you probably also have to be very connected to what's going on in the world in terms of uh, the news. And as we know, um, you know, in, in the spiritual community that sometimes the news can get distorted, giving a message of fear. So how do you stay grounded in learning about what's going on in the world? Because, you know, you have to be informed about what's going on, all the events without falling into the fear traps that sometimes um, people can get into when consuming uh, information. Yeah, yeah. I talk about this a lot, as you know, Emilio. You know, uh, well, firstly, get rid of your television. I now have a beautiful large plant <laughs> here instead of a television. I, that's the first piece of advice I give. Um, but really recognize the endless pattern of the next really big scary thing. You know, <gasps> other really big scary thing. You know, if you've ever been in an abusive relationship, you get to the point of saying, Do you know what, I'm just done with really big, scary things. So for me, I am close to nature. Yes, I'm very aware of what's going on in the world, but I see it from a point of divine neutrality. I see it from my eagle's perch. I observe it. And I think, well, is that true? Is that not? It might be. But actually, there's so many layers to smoke and mirrors. There's so much deception, misinformation. I'm just going to observe it and see if it's linked to the astrology, which is unfolding. And I will trust the astrology. And I will trust the evolutionary promise and the expansion of consciousness that I see in the astrology. So I will just observe and say, yep, I'm sort of clocked into what's happening. But I'm actually seeing it at a different mm. level because if you look at the so-called you know and they are revolutions that are happening in europe and the us right now i'm thinking that is bullseye that is smack on what i expected to see <clears throat> astrologically so if you're on the ground it might be uncomfortable you know going to be food shortages and very difficult things at a 3d level but actually it's a necessary breakdown of the old world to break through to something much more magnificent. So we've got to, we've got to trust. For me, I'm so lucky because I have the language of astrology. I can mm. trust this. After all these years, I trust the astrology. I trust the evolution. I trust this tsunami of love that I feel gets stronger and stronger in the people I connect to and in my days. And I make that my purpose to live through love to live through my heart, to live through love, to beam out love to the world, particularly if I have any difficult neighbours or anything. You know, I will, I will bless them and beam out love. 
and that works wonders to soften any difficult dynamics. But I am going to do everything I can in my lifetime here to beam up love to the world to make a difference. Because astrology, yes or no, that is the thing that will really make the difference. But it also gives you objectivity. You know, the, the astrology gives me the perspective, gives the objectivity that I can say this, see the same cycles repeating through time and vortexing upwards. But we're moving into a stage where it's all about love. So I can mm. add in that huge dollop of love on top of it. So I don't know if that's answered your question, Emilio. Yeah, I always love to repeat this quote that I heard from from Robert, and we've been talking so much about him. So I uh, just pertain to the conversation that he says, um, enlightenment is when the expression of love supersedes the seeking for truth. Yeah, beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. And and yeah, because I think we go through stages, don't we? We go through a stage of um, disillusionment and we go through a stage of seeking for truth on our mm -hmm. journey. And I think many of us have done that. And then we kind of go beyond that and think that doesn't really matter either because I'm creating my truth. I'm creating my reality from the inside out. I wake up. I say, I will dominate my day with love. I will dominate my day with joy. So whatever's happening in the outside world, I am creating my tomorrow and I'm helping the collective to create their tomorrows because tomorrow is invisible. Tomorrow hasn't happened yet. We're helping it manifest. It's completely invisible. So you and I, Emilio, are changing the collective in this conversation because if we can send out love in this, in this interchange between us, that will change tomorrow's future for the collective. We're playing our own little part in that. So, and I think also I've recommended something terribly simple to people, you know, stick post-it notes all around your house. What's your frequency? Are you dipping into fear? Because that's not going to get you or the collective anyway. You're going to create more fear tomorrow. You're going to get more of you think of what you think about all day long. So stop it. Stop it. Check yeah. in like a thought policeman. Just stop it and turn your feelings to love. Do you have a pet you love, a child you love, a friend you love, a tree you love? Flick it into love in the simplest way you get. Do you love the bird song? But get into love by being aware when you dip in your frequency and go into fear. Hmm. And Pam, you have inspired a flood of new astrologers um, that have um, learned about you, learned from you. And there's also going to be a huge wave of next generation astrologers. And we've even like scratched the surface in this conversation about what's coming new to astrology, the dwarf planet, so much is changing. So where would you begin for people um, that are dipping their toes into astrology? They're young or they just they're just getting into the field. Where would you guide them? Um, yeah, great, because you know the young people now coming in are so gifted. They're going to get the, just the download without having to do mm. the slog of the study like I did. It's a whole new era of just yeah, you just get the download. So they won't have to go through all those decades of textbooks and <laughs> logarithms and working out charts by hand. They won't have to do that. So I think I would simply say to start, there are quite a few astrologers on YouTube. See who draws you energetically, just in just in energy. And then you can, um, I've got some uh, training videos on my website that go from beginners to more advanced. Dip into those. They're all very inexpensive. I want them to be accessible to people. And then just see that will start you on your astrological journey as you start to understand your own birth chart. And if you set a clear intention that the perfect teacher will come to you in this moment to help you on your astrological journey, whether that's a physical human being or whether that's not Turian. Mm. Set that clear intention that that perfect being will come to you to instruct you and, and it will manifest for you. But the mm. young people are going to be picking it up by osmosis in a different way. Yeah, and it all starts with intention as that's how we started this episode. And to end it, um, we, we like to end with a segment called the final trio, which are briefly rapid fire questions that you can answer in any way that you want um but before that where can people find you pam and connect with you and learn deeper with you yep um website is pamgregory.com 
YouTube, which is super busy, is Pam Gregory Astrology, not Astrologer, that's the scammer, Pam Gregory Astrology. Um, and, that's yeah. the scammer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Report him right now, or her, or they. they. Right. It's, yeah. Anyway, we just sort of move on from it. But yes, I put out a you know, fair few videos, five, six a month, some just astrological updates, some interviews, I'm being interviewed, or I'm interviewing someone else. And there's very rich information there, a lot of rich material there that people can... Um, um, can learn from yeah so that's a good start point amazing beautiful um for the final trio the first two questions are personalized to the guest and the final one we ask at the end of every show so the first one is what does it mean to be a human wow it means Gosh, it means loving the physicality of existence because I think that's the reason we are ascending in physicality, to keep our physicality. And so rejoice in your senses, particularly when you're in nature. Rejoice in your senses, the bark on the trees, the, the smell of, you know, of spring flowers, the sound of the bird song. Develop that heightened awareness of the senses and that only comes i think you know if we're just a spirit we can't feel that so really delight and rejoice in the, in the, in the in the senses that only come with our physicality as a human well i have no problem with that because my moon is in it's taurus <laughs> Perfect place for your moon to be. Yeah, you've got heightened awareness anyway with all those senses. <laughs> I love the sensual pleasures, the food. The <laughs> yeah, all of that. Yeah, of course, it's exalted. It's in a fabulous place. Mm -hmm. The second one is if we were on an airplane right now, we didn't know each other. And I saw you with a birth chart doing your thing. And I said, you don't really believe in astrology, do you? <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to them? I do. But I also say you don't have to believe in it. Because you don't mm. say, do you believe in French? Do you believe in German? Do you believe in Spanish? It's, it's a language. It's a language. It's not a belief system. It's not a religion. It's, it's a language which gives us a different paradigm, a different cut through into reality that I don't think any other modality does in the same way. I mean, there's some fabulous modalities out there and they have their own cut throughs, but astrology gives you a very specific and distinct one to make sense both practically and spiritually of whatever we are experiencing now, historically going forwards. It gives you very clear cosmic language and it's a sacred language. It's a profound language of geometry and meaning. And that's what I'd say sitting next to you on the mm. plane. I love that. And I, I love how you refer to it as a sacred language. Have you ever tried to learn any other language other than English? Yes, French, because I've had mm. French lifetimes as well. So, yes, I, I did pretty well on my, on my it's drivel now because I haven't used it for a few years, but <laughs> it, was, it was pretty good at one point. Yeah. And uh, how does it compare to be learning astrology versus French? Yeah, for brilliant question. Brilliant. Um, astrology is much more complicated. It's like using mm. French times, you know, to the ninth cubed, as it were. It's, um, it's way because it's so multi layered. You can get yeah. to the point with any um, foreign language where you say, yep, I've cracked it. Yes, I can speak fluently in that language. Yes, I know it now. It's finite, as it were. You never, ever, ever get to that point with astrology. Mm. It's so vast. It's so infinite. I mean, after all my years, I learn something new every single day. Every single day, there's something new. And it's just going further and further out in the cosmos. It's mm. never boring. It's never dull. So, yes, from that point of view, it's, um, it's sacred, infinite, and magnificent. Yeah. What came to mind is that human language was created by the ego limited mind and astrology was created by the infinite higher mind of god of the universe beautiful so i like that wow. a lot beautiful <laughs> absolutely and again the pyramids may teach us much about that mm, i think wow. you know yeah i don't know if you've seen rob edward grant's uh, podcast from this morning on uh, the next um soul next level soul podcast yeah it's not yet 
Not yet. Yeah, yeah. Recommended. It's mind blowing <laughs> because I think from that and his investigations, we are going to just go in leaps and bounds. But what you've just said is that it's just beautiful. <laughs> The last question, Pam, is called the time capsule question. And essentially, it uh, helps us look out into the future a bit around 15, 20 years. Um, I guess when we're when we're in the lower tail of this transit in Pluto. Um, but essentially, I chose this time frame because that's when the next generation of leaders uh, the young people now are going to be stepping more into leadership positions. Yeah. And you were given the opportunity to leave behind a time capsule for these leaders where they will step into a room and they will see all these different time capsules from wisdom keepers, paradigm shifters. And inside those time capsules are going to be the the tools, the knowledge, the wisdom um, that are going to help them lead into the new earth. And you could leave anything behind in this time capsule. It doesn't have to be physical. It could be an energetic transmission. It can be a book. It can be a teaching. It can be whatever your mind can conceive of. Um, but what would you leave behind for these leaders inside a time capsule? Wow. Beautiful question. Beautiful question. <laughs> I think I would say um, always live with, with love, with humility with integrity, with compassion, with joy, and always welcome in an expanded consciousness of love on your journey. Mm, I love that. And on top of the time capsule, there's a golden plate where it would be your name <laughs> and a question, a reflective, contemplative question that you could leave behind. So when they open it, they can have that sort of question in mind um, when they're going about to create and envision a future. Right. It would be, is your dharma acting in the highest good for all? Is your dharma acting in the highest good for all? I love and you need to put my name on it. I'm <laughs> <laughs> the universe. <laughs> Pam, thank you so much. Infinite blessings. Um, we really went deep and that was our intention with this episode. Um, of course, I would always love to have you back on if that is something that you are up to. Um, and thank you so much for your infinite uh, service to humanity uh, for all the wisdom that you are holding and sharing as well. Because a lot of people, they go to their deathbed with the wisdom all, all in their head and what you've done is share it and reached millions of people. So thank you so much for your service. I've, I've loved it, Emilio. You've, you've gone into some very different areas and kind of stretched my brain a little bit, with her, <laughs> which I love, actually. It was, um, yeah, asked very different questions. So, And God bless you. You're starting this 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 journey of, of service very young. And so you will you will be able to help um, so many people in their evolution. This is just the beginning of um, a long, amazing, wise journey of love for you too. Well, I haven't stopped smiling this whole conversation. <laughs> Aho, and thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been a joy. It. I've loved it, Amelia. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm honored. Yes.